So tonight, um, this is what we're going to be doing. What are political parties? And we're going to break it down um, and look at the impact of political parties, both on voters and then also on our government. We're going to look at the changes in parties over time. Um, so we didn't always have Republicans and Democrats. We had other political parties. And even when we did have Republicans, you got to be kidding me here. <laughs> even when we did have Republicans and Democrats, um, they didn't look like the Republican and Democratic Party we have today, so we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about third-party candidates, who they are, um, why they run, and why they have never won a major election. We've seen third-party candidates win governorships and um, some smaller elections, um, but we've never seen them win the big beast, which is the presidency. And we're going to talk about why that is and get into a little bit about could it ever happen. Um, and then we're also going to do some of those great practice questions that we've been ending a lot of our streams with, looking at those multiple choice questions. So let's jump right into this um, and talk about political parties and how it all happened. Um, so political parties, a simple definition, an organized group of people or organized groups of people with similar political ideologies and goals. Um, funny little story about our first president, George Washington. Uh, that's a quote from, right, come on. That's a quote from his farewell dress. Um, and in his farewell dress, he specifically, I don't know, these past couple weeks, these cats have been like nonstop. Um, in his farewell dress, he specifically warns against political parties. Um, he saw political parties as being mischievous. Um, he said that it would end up splitting our country apart. And it's all very fascinating when you are watching the news today and you think about political parties and everything that's going on in our country with them. Um, but just understand, like, political parties, when you think about it, you know, I gave you that standard definition of what they are. But their whole point is really to work to get candidates elected, right, to public office. And they want to get candidates elected who represent the values of the political party. And we're going to see that political parties really develop right after the American Revolution. We have a lot of social and economic divisions in our country, um, which is going to lend itself to political parties. And again, we're going to, some of the slides are going to start from the very beginning, our very first political parties and how it happened. And you, Frankie, come on. And you're going to see from the very beginning, we've had what we have today, which is this two-party system. So that's been something that's been going on from the very beginning. That's not anything new to our country. Um, and so I'm so sorry about this with these darn cats. Um, and just know that political parties a lot of times is cut off um, because of my picture, but they're influenced by special interest groups. Um, and we're going to talk about that as well and what exactly that means. Um, as we continue moving through this PowerPoint. Frank, okay, everyone off. Here we go. Frank, you get down. So we're going to jump into the nitty gritty and the specifics of each of these. Um, but just real quick, this is what the impact of political parties are um, or their whole purpose, so to speak. So they're there to mobilize and educate voters. They're there to create platforms, recruit candidates, manage campaigns, and then also to govern. And don't worry that I just read through that like a speed racer, because again, we're going to break each of those down specifically. Um, so it's like double the slides here. So anyway, um, so what we're going to look at is the fact that um, political parties, they do work to mobilize and to educate voters. Um, so just start first by talking about mobilizing voters. Okay, hold on one second. Let me just get him down. He's driving me nuts. Um, so as far as mobilizing voters, so political parties, what they want to do is they want to make sure that they're getting all their party members out to vote on election day, right? So it's one thing to have the support of people, but people need to actually get themselves to the poll to cast those ballots. So you'll see that a lot of political parties will actually send things in the mail, they'll phone, give you a phone call, an email, they'll come knock on your door right prior to an election. Um, you'll have those robocalls, which are those like pre-recorded messages, which is not a live person on the phone. It's kind of just a message saying, don't forget on Tuesday, November, whatever it might be, um, you need to go and vote uh, for so-and-so. And it's just reminders to do it. They might also have like voter registration drives, like so where they'll set up in a neighborhood outside a grocery store or somewhere and just try to get people to register to vote as well. 
So just getting voters up and out of their homes to the polls um, or to register to vote is one big impact that political parties are going to have, right? They're going to mobilize the people. Um, they're also going to educate voters, right? That's a big thing when you think about it, too, as far as education is concerned. So as with educating voters, they want to make sure that voters understand the issues um, and understand what it is that they're kind of voting for in a sense. Um, and so that's a really important thing as far as letting um, voters know this is kind of what the issues are in our country. You know, so this is the economic crisis that we might be in. And these are the ways in which our political party plans on fixing that economic crisis. So just making sure voters kind of understand where our country is right now and where it's going um, and what that political party specifically plans to do for our country. That, in a sense, is educating voters. Um, and that's super important. Um, they also provide education in the sense of they're helping candidates um, and training them on how to run an effective campaign. So educating voters, um, also it's important to understand the fact that they're also training um, our candidates to help them um, run this super important campaign. Um, creating platforms. So political parties platform is basically what it stands for. So, you know, look at the major issues impacting our country. Healthcare, um, abortion is a big topic. Gun control is a big topic. Social security, taxes. And so the political party's platform is where each party specifically stands on those issues. It's kind of their written list of beliefs and their political goals. So what we see like today in our modern Republican Party is that they tend to be a little bit more conservative, right? So we see them advocating for like a strong national defense, uh, reduction of wasteful government spending, um, and not a lot of regulations on businesses. Whereas Democrats, we're going to see, tend to have more of a liberal um, um, platform, so to speak. Um, and you'll see that they're kind of more into spending on social programs, whereas Republicans aren't so much for that. Um, not that the Democrats want to cut national defense, but you don't want, they don't want to see it raising to the levels that the Republicans tend to want to see it raising to. So the whole idea of the impact of political parties on the platform is just the fact that it's up to the political parties to really come up with this written list of beliefs and political goals that they tend to achieve. And then you know if a candidate signs on to that political party that they're going to vote for um, or represent those ideals um, should they become elected. So if they get elected to Congress, to the presidency, whatever it might be, you know that they're going to end up following those ideals that are set forth in the political party's platform. Um, and again, we're going to get into kind of who votes for each party and the ways in which they've changed, because just know the way I just kind of described the Republican Party wasn't necessarily always like that um, from the get go. This, so this is Frankie, who keeps jumping up here and not wanting to stay down. Um, I'm not sure what his deal is. Anyway, as far as recruiting candidates are concerned, so parties are always looking for talent to people to run for office. Um, they also like those candidates even better if those candidates kind of have their own financial resources or some sort of strong following, um, just because it's going to be easier to get those candidates off the ground if they do. We'll see that like nowadays, social media is a good way for candidates to initially get themselves out there. And a lot of times what we'll see with political parties, um, you know, political parties and even the candidates themselves, they'll kind of run ahead of time um, different polls and different surveys just to get an idea of how well they'll do prior to really making their announcements so that they know if they'll do well or not. Because nobody wants to run for, you know, say they're going to run for office and then all of a sudden realize they're actually not going to do well running for office. Um, so political parties help people go through all that. Um, political parties also help people with fundraising, right? So yeah, it's great and it's awesome if from the get-go you come in with your own um, set of money. So if you look at some of the Democratic candidates now, one of them, Tom Steyer, he's kind of right now at this point using a lot of his own money to run for office. And so that's pretty cool. Um, just like if you look at Donald Trump, 
you know, he had used a lot of his own money in the beginning to run for office before the Republican Party kind of started helping out. So the whole idea of fundraising and the fact that your political um, political parties will help you to fundraise just because, again, they want to get you elected. So holding fundraisers for you is kind of a good thing for them to do. Um, and you'll see that the national political parties will donate to candidates along the way. And then the last one, which again is being cut off, and I apologize for that, that's media strategy. So it's a political party um, through managing of your campaign that will help you with the media strategy. So media strategy in the past used to be like TV ads but now, and, the, and radio ads, of course. But now we're seeing social media is a huge part of media strategy. And that really started with President Obama. And then even President Trump was really able to utilize social media to his benefit as well. Um, but we'll see that when we're talking about like TV, it's not only the commercials that candidates are putting together and paying for, but it's also news stories that might be played about that candidate. That's going to be huge um, anytime, you know, a, a positive news story, of course. But anytime like there's a positive news story about maybe a candidate like, um, you know, volunteering somewhere or doing something good, um, that's something that a political party would like to use and like to see to help their candidate along. Um, but media strategy is a big one. And they specifically, you'll see that political parties will actually specifically hire people whose sole responsibility is to set the media strategy for a campaign. Does anyone have any questions before? I'm going to flip to the next slide. Um, but if you have any questions, just let me know. All right, cool. So what we're going to move on to now, so that was kind of the impact of political parties on voters. Um, what we're going to look at now is the impact of political parties on the government. Um, and so, wait, hold on, no, don't stop. It almost ended the broadcast. I don't want to do that. Um, so anyway, um, again, switching gears to now talking about the impact of political parties on the government itself. Um, and so political parties, as far as government, we have to look at the breakdown and the structure of political parties um, in order to understand the way it's impacted. So party structures, um, they have a party chairperson. So you'll see that there's a Democratic chair of the political party and then a Republican chair of their party. And basically, the party chairperson is the street cha chief strategy maker and spokesperson through that party. Um, and so a lot of times that person will appear on public television shows at major party events. Um, they're the ones who kind of guide the party's daily operations, build up membership, seek funding, recruit candidates. Um, sometimes if you need a spokesperson for a political party, you would go to the chairperson to get a reaction to something. Um, this position's not a part of the government. It's just a part of the political party. We have seen some um, chair people of political parties also serve in elected office, but you don't have to be in order to do that. So like George H.W. Bush um, served as a political chairperson of the Republican Party at one time, and Howard Dean also served as the chairperson of the Democratic Party at one time. Um, so just know like that's possible but you don't have to be an elected official in order to be the chair of the political party. You just have to be really active within your political party. And then there's Hill committees. So both parties have non-lawmaking committees in each House of Congress. And basically what they do is they strategize how to win seats in the House and the Senate. Um, so a lot of times these are referred to Hill committees. They're gonna be members of Congress. Um, and basically their responsibility is to recruit candidates for open seats. So like nowadays on the news, we're hearing about different Congress people who are either retiring or not running for office, right? So recently, I think it was a Republican from Florida who a couple of days ago just announced that he's planning not to seek reelection. So the Hill Committee is now looking at, okay, who can we possibly recruit that lives in his district in Florida to run for the Republican party um, in that district. So that's kind of the purpose of the Hill Committee is just to make sure they're um, helping to recruit candidates um, and helping to um, 
hold leadership positions um, and advance their party within Congress. All right, now that's Johnny with the white on him, who is now joining the fray. We're going to send him down as well. Um, any, hey, Tan, how are you? Um, any questions about the impact of political parties on the government before we move on to our next slide? We'll see how long the uh, cats can stay out of the way as we continue on here. This slide here, um, which is quite meaty, as you can see, this is probably the most important part as far, far as the AP test is concerned um, when we're talking about party realignment and then dealignment. And this is kind of what I alluded to in the very beginning when I said, you know, we didn't start with Democrats and Republicans and even the Democratic and Republican Party. If you look at them today, they're not quite the party that we had when they first began. And so that's because of this concept of party realignment. The whole idea that parties change um, as they go through time, right? So think about it. Like even as you grow up, you're going to see like who you are at one age is going to change as you get older because things happen. Society changes, right? Technology happens. And parties have to realign to kind of catch up with different trends and different events taking place within society. And so we're going to start off by talking about, and depending on what textbook you use, um, just so this isn't too confusing, you might see it referred to in two different ways. So sometimes one textbook will refer to it as the first party system. Sometimes a textbook will, will refer to it as the first realignment. And of course, AP we'll use both, right? Why not just decide on one to make it super easy for us? But anyway, this is going to take place between 1796 to 1824. So this is our country just kicked off the Constitution. George Washington, right, he's exiting as president, gives his farewell address, says no political parties, they're going to ruin our country. And then, right, let's take his advice and form political parties, which is the opposite of what he said. So what we're going to see during this time period are two political parties. Um, the one political party, which will be Thomas Jefferson's party, will be the Democratic Republicans. Um, and the next political party, which will be Alexander Hamilton's party, will be the Federalists. And what we see when these realignments take place is there's usually either a major event or a big time election that takes place that leads to these realignments. So in this case, we have the election of 1800. Um, so those folks who are out there, does anyone recall from your historical days, maybe you took a push, um, why was the election of 1800 considered such a turning point in our country? Why was that election a big deal? I think Frankie here wants to answer. Sometimes the election of 1800, I don't know if this will help anyone, um, is referred to as the revolution of 1800. So the election of 1800 um, is seen as a big deal. Um, nope. Okay. So I'm gonna uh, help you out, help you all out here. The election of 1800 um, or the Revolution of 1800 is seen as a big deal. This is the election where Thomas Jefferson is elected to become president, um, and it's a big deal because prior to Thomas Jefferson was Al uh, was John Adams as our president. John Adams being a Federalist, Thomas Jefferson being a Democrat Republican. And it was huge in the sense that this is the first time we're going to have a transfer of power between political parties. And guess what? Our country didn't fall apart. So that's why it's kind of seen as a revolution of 1800. Um, but in a positive way, sometimes we see revolutions as deadly and bad. This was actually a very peaceful revolution. But the whole idea being we have this transfer of power between political parties and our country makes it. Um, important to understand during this first alignment in our country, um, that the Federalists tended to be very much into industry and supporting manufacturing, right? Alexander Hamilton, who was Secretary of the Treasury, he wanted to focus on import taxes and building up our industry, whereas your Democratic Republicans, they tended to be more states' rights people. Let's have a weaker federal government. We have PTSD still from Britain, um, and they were... the Big on farming, right? Thomas Jefferson wanted a land of agrarian farmers. Um, and so we're going to see that their policies tended to reflect that. 
Um, so that's kind of the way our political parties really started in our country. That was the first party system. Um, come election 1828, we're going to have another major election that's going to shift things. Um, that's going to move into our second party system, which again, sometimes is referred to um, as the second alignment. Does anyone remember who was running in the election of 1828? So I let me give you a hint to see if this helps you at all. Um, part of his campaign was talking about a corrupt bargain. Um, he was complaining about the election of 1824 in which he ran and he lost to John Quincy Adams. Um, and he talked about a corrupt bargain. Yeah, Jackson, very good, Ashley. Yeah, so Andrew Jackson, we have him running. Um, he wins the election of 1828. And what we see happen at this point in time, the Federalist Party has really died out. And we see this division taking place in the, that Democratic Republican Party. And so Jackson, at this point in time, we're going to see is going to end up leading to his followers, his supporters are going to end up leading to what becomes known as our Democratic Party today. Now, keep in mind, we're saying it's our Democratic Party today, but their values, the people who tend to support them are going to be completely different than literally our Democratic Party today. Um, it's just that this is the first time that we're really going to use that word Democrat. Um, and they're going to get started with the party of Jackson. At going against um, Jackson and the Democratic Party would be the Whig Party. Um, and the Whig Party is going to be a faction that really broke off of um, those Democratic Republicans because, again, it's going to split in two. And the Whigs during this time period are going to kind of be that old Alexander Hamilton group. Um, it's going to be Henry Clay, who's going to be with us for a lot of the 1800s. But we're going to see that um, a lot of the Whigs um, during this time period are going to come from the North. Um, and that in the end, there are some Southerners in the Whig Party. In the end, what's going to break apart that Whig Party and really break apart our entire country when you think about it is going to be that issue of slavery. Um, but during this time period, we have the Democrats, we have the Whig Party, um, and we're even going to see with the Democrats, again, when we get to that issue of slavery, um, it's going to even break apart the Democratic Party into the fact that we're going to have Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats. You love that party. It's um, the Whig Party you love. It takes its name from um, some old British times. Yeah, it does sound pretty cool. Um, so come 1860, I've kind of been giving clues as to what major event in our country is going to fracture our entire country and just change things completely. What is that event that starts in 1860 and goes to 1865 that's going to lead into this next realignment in our country? Civil War. Very good, Ashley. Yeah, so the Civil War is going to take place and it's going to completely tear apart our country. Um, but at this point in time, we're going to see the formation of the Republican Party. So Abe Lincoln and the Republicans um, will get started at this point in time. And what's interesting is the Republican Party at this point in time get a lot of their followers from the North, right, because they're against slavery, whereas we're seeing that our Democratic Party at this time are going to get a lot of their followers from the South because they're for slavery. And when, again, you think of who belongs to the Republicans and Democratic Party today, generally, it's actually the complete opposite. And we're going to get to where and when and why that all ended up changing. But that second 1860 election, it's just important to understand that's when we're going to see that next realignment take place. Um, and we're going to see the formation of the two political parties that we know today. So that's going to be huge moving forward. Um, the fourth realignment is going to take place, as you can see on our slide, um, come 1932. What is happening in the United States in the 1930s? Um, starts in 1929, the Great Depression. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, and welcome. Uh, your first time, I think, for when I've been broadcasting. Welcome to uh, AP Gov here. So, um, yeah, the Great Depression is going to take place. And again, another major event. So you can see how all these realignments are taking place around some sort of major event or, again, as I said, a major election. 
So in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, we see that America is going to go from being mostly Republican to being solidly Democratic. And that's thanks to FDR. He's a Democrat. And it's also thanks to what's known as his New Deal Coalition. And the New Deal Coalition is basically made up of Democratic state and local party organizations, labor unions, blue collar workers, minorities, farmers, white Southerners, people living in poverty, immigrants, and intellectuals, which I like to refer to myself as an intellectual. Um, but we're going to see it's at this point in time that Black Americans who tended to vote for the Republican Party prior to this, right? Because prior to this, the Republican Party was anti-slavery, um, and they were the party to try to lead Reconstruction after the Civil War. But it's at this point in time during the Great Depression that we're going to see Black Americans shift from being mostly Republican to shift to that Democratic Party. Um, and the 1932 presidential, presidential election is going to be the first time that more Blacks are actually going to vote Democrat um, than Republican. So this New Deal coalition really shifts um, a lot of how people tend to vote in our country. Um, we're going to see that it's the, the New Deal coalition that will lead to FDR going to uh, the presidency, being elected to the presidency four different times. Um, obviously. The economic crisis in our country, we're getting involved in World War II when we move into the 40s. There is a lot going on that people want the consistency of him as president. But important to understand, it's that New Deal coalition that's really going to lead to and spur him to that office. And then our last realignment that's going to take place uh, is in 1968. What is going on in our country in the 1960s that might lead to a realignment. And this is kind of referred to as a Southern realignment to give you even maybe more of a hint. So yeah, for sure, we have the Vietnam War going on and that's gonna have a huge impact. Um, and we'll talk about that in a sec. And then there's one other big thing taking place in the 60s. Cold War is taking place, yep, yep. So this has to do with a Civil rights movement. Yes, man. High five for that. Civil rights movement. Yeah. So, and because we're focusing on Southern realignment, right, we're looking at civil rights and Martin Luther King and JFK and everything that's taking place during this time period. And so what we see during this time period is that, again, African Americans are going to be predominantly supporting the Democratic Party. Um, but we're also going to see that the South, which tends to be against the civil rights movement, this is where the South is really going to make that move to the Republican Party. Because during this time period, it's the Democrats who are really seen as pushing forward civil rights and pushing forward equality. And the South wants no part of that. So we're going to see that the South, which used to be solidly Democrat, prior to, in all the other previous elections, um, that the South have now left that New Co Deal coalition because of the civil rights movement, and the South has now joined the Republican Party. Um, and so we're going to see the development of the people who support those two political parties really take place um, because of the civil rights movement. Um, and also, I like that little hand clap, Ashley. Um, also, what's important to understand, and you all brought it up too, um, the Vietnam War is going to have a huge impact during this time period. Um, moving into the 1970s, we're going to have Richard Nixon's Watergate scandal, which is going to bring a lot of mistrust of government and a mistrust of the parties. Um, and so what we see because of that, um, we're going to see a lot of people saying, you know what, to heck with the Republicans, to the heck with the Democrats. I don't want to deal with either or. And we're going to see this new group known as independents come about. Not independents in the sense that there's going to be a third party officially in our country, but independents in the sense that from election to election, they're going to jump back and forth and either vote Republican or Democrat, but they're not going to always vote Republican and they're not always going to vote Democrat. They're independent and it's going to depend on the election. And that's what's known as party de-alignment. When you have independents who are being turned away from politics altogether, it's a headache to them. They just don't want to deal with it. And that's when party de-alignment is going to end up taking place. 
And we've seen that happening more often in our country. You know, and Ashley, we're going to get into that whole conversation. And if, I don't know if it's the next slide or a couple slides, but we're definitely going to talk about this whole idea of third parties, right? Because think and how that would dramatically change our political party structure. Um, and also why it's hard for a third party to really become noticed in our country. I'm going to move on to the next slide. As I'm doing that, I'll give you all a second if you have a question you want to ask. All right, so we're going to move into money, right? So one of the things we had said about the impact of political parties is the fact that, you know, they're there for fundraising. Um, and so political parties, um, they need to, in order to advertise for their candidates, they need money to do so. And so we do have things to try to make sure, in a sense, um, that these the money they're spending is regulated. So we have the Federal Election Commission, which is the FEC. It was created in 1974 and basically monitors um, campaign contributions. Um, so it, if you make a political contribution, right, to our government, um, you have the government or the political party actually has to report that to the FEC. So if you're an individual, if you're a business and you're making a contribution to a political candidate, you're making a contribution to a PAC, which we'll talk about in a second, what a PAC is, um, or you're making a contribution to just an Ash, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, um, you, it has to be reported by those organizations. And then we all, as US citizens, actually have access to that information. So I'm gonna type in a website in the chat here don't go to it right now, save it for later um, so we can continue on here. But if you go to this website, opensecrets.org, um, you can actually type in um, your zip code and it'll tell you all the people who live in your area um, and who they are donating money to because legally all that information needs to be reported to FEC. And this is usually where I lose my students when we're discussing this in class because they have to go and check all this out. So hold on for 25 more minutes and then you can go look up your areas and find that information. Um, but the FEC, um, they do di distinguish between hard money and soft money. So hard money is any contribution that is subjected to be regulated by the FEC. Um, so there is there are strict limits on how much a person can donate um, as an individual, how much you can donate to political action committees um, and political parties. Um, and just so we know, a political action committee is an organization that collects political donations from its members and uses the funds to influence an election, um, either by supporting or opposing a candidate. So a lot of times during the election time period when we're watching commercials on TV, it has to tell you who paid for that commercial. A lot of times you'll see, it'll say like paid for by, and then it'll name some political action committee who's paying for that. So like the NRA, you might tend to see them pay for um, political ads that will support Republican candidates because Republican candidates tend to favor um, laxer gun policy laws. Um, so you might see like something, a climate organization, a climate pack doing a political campaign ad for a Democratic candidate because they would tend to support them a little bit more. Um, soft money are donations that are not regulated by the FPC. Um, and so these are contributions that were made for the purpose of party building activities. So if you're donating money, not for a specific candidate, but money that will be used to build the party, um, then that is considered soft money and there's not a lot of limitations on how much you can donate. So for instance, you might want to, the NRA um, might decide to do an ad just on why it's important not to have too many strict gun laws in our country, right? So they're not specifically saying go and vote for this candidate or this candidate. They're just talking about a specific issue within the country that would be considered a soft money do donation. 
because they're not coming out and say voting for a candidate explicitly. Those of us who know where candidates stand will know, oh, well, this is probably a commercial for Trump, right? But because they didn't specifically say Trump and they're just talking about an issue, that's considered soft money. There's not limitations on that. And so that's a little bit of a scary loophole as far as how political parties can kind of get around um, taking in more money from individuals. Um, super PACs um, are similar to a PAC, except that super PACs are allowed to collect unlimited funds from a variety of sources. Um, these sources might be corporations, labor unions, and the whole idea is they're allowed to collect all these um, monies as long as money does not go directly to a candidate's election campaign or to a political party. So the money could be used for advertising to, to support or disparage any candidate um, as long as the super PAC isn't formally coordinating with the candidate. So for instance, the super PAC can spend all the money in the world that they want on either Trump or whoever the Democratic candidate will be running against them as long as the super PAC is making the commercial and they're not giving the money to the Republicans or the Democrats to make the commercial. Um, and so again, super PACs have sometimes been called into question as far as, um, you know, should they be actually regulated more from the FEC because it's kind of a little bit scary as to um, how much money they have and the damage that they can do with that money. So, that's a super PAC. That's our campaign finance laws. Any questions before I think we move on to what I believe, if I am remembering correctly, will be um, our third parties or not. It's political messages. <laughs> um, any questions before we move on to political messages? We will at some point get to third parties. I promise you that. There's a question in the question box. Oh, thank you. Let's look at that. So since the South became more Republican, why did Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, oh, this is such a good question. Why did Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton do so well in the South? Awesome question, thank you for asking. I did not see that question box, so thank you, Ashley, for drawing that to my attention. Um, so Bill Clinton um, from Arkansas, Jimmy Carter, um, who was from Georgia, um, they did well in those two Southern states, um, but if you look at the overall, um, as far as how they did in the South, um, they didn't do, they didn't do terrible, but they didn't do as well as um, past, like other Republican candidates have done. So Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton are both Democrat. Um, they weren't trounced in the South, but their Southern roots did help. And it's interesting that you ask that because what you'll see a lot of times when we have presidential candidates running for office, say the candidate is from the South, a lot of times for the most part, um, you might see them try to choose a candidate from an area that they don't think they can win. So Bill Clinton, he chose Al Gore. Um, Jimmy Carter, I can't believe this, but slipping my mind right now who his vice presidential candidate was from. Um, but you do tend to see like, um, they will choose candidates who kind of will help them get the votes that they don't need, that they can't get. Um, but Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter, both being from the South originally, did help them. Walter Mondale, Minnesota, thank you, very good. So um, I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so they did win the presidency, but I'm just going to pull it up real quick. Um, so let's go to Bill Clinton. And I'll see if I can share this with you. I'm not sure if I'll be able to or not. Um, so the election of 1992 is one of the elections that we saw um, Bill Clinton running in with Al Gore. And if you look at the map um, as far as um, the South is concerned, so in this election, we see that, let's see, the 1992 actual, let me see, I think I can share this. Just give me one second to figure out how to do it. Let me close this. And then where is my share? No. Okay. I don't know how to wait. Share. Nope. That's going to show the slides. So if you were to Google the election map, I wish there was a better way for me to do this. 
Um, but if you were to look at the electoral maps, you would see that Bill Clinton, um, he won some states in the South, but for the most part, you would see that H, uh, George H.W. Bush ended up winning a lot of the South. So yeah, Bill Clinton was able to win Arkansas, which he was from. He won Tennessee and Georgia, um, but he didn't really win um, like the South. Like you can't say he really won the South. Um, he did better in the South than like some of the previous candidates, but um, the South still predominantly, if you look at the electoral map, ended up going um, for George H.W. Bush. Um, but you do tend a lot of times, we see it's really bad if presidents don't, but you do tend a lot of times um, to see presidents end up winning um, their home states. Um, any questions though? I hope that answers your question. Um, before we move on to changes in this communication here. All right, awesome. So political messaging, um, what we see as this is concerned is the fact that a lot of times, um, because of the fact that Big Brother like is constantly watching us, which is kind of scary when you think about it, um, but we do tend to see like categorizing groups of voters um, and the fact that you do have these different digital tools um, that can be used to um, reach and send different messages to different people. So for instance, um, you know, if we look at demographics, we might see that political parties will make sure that if they see a high demographic population living in one area and they know it's a population that they want to target with a specific ad, you'll see them create their ad around that. They'll also use what's known as psychographics, um, which kind of sounds scary, but um, is not meant to be scary. Um, but basically psychographics in a sense is kind of analyzing um, people's personality, their lifestyle, their social class. And they do that in order to categorize groups of people. Um, so a psychographic will explain why people vote the way they do. Demographics tend to look at who the voters are, their race, their gender, their age, um, their church. Um, but psychographics will say, okay, these might be their demographics and their characteristics, but now we're going to actually come out and say they're voting the way they do because these are their values, their hobbies, their habits, their likes, whatever it might be. And then they'll actually construct a message around all that that they believe will run as, run as it resonate. Um, with the person who's viewing that message. Um, and so that makes that's kind of a scary tactic because it shows you just how much, like, yeah, absolutely a lot, Ashley, like political socialization. Um, it shows you how much, um, in a sense, people know about us and they get all this information through Facebook and Instagram and all the different likes or the ads that you might view. Um, timing is also important of their political message, right? So like when they drop that commercial, when they give that specific speech, there it's like an art form um, to the time in which they do that. Everything is metered to be done at an exact moment in time. So their message is picked up in the best way. Um, and we saw a lot of this come to light with the 2016 election and Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, and Facebook is still getting kind of a lot of slack today as far as are they protecting people um, and their information? Because the whole thing here was, was Facebook, in a sense, selling our data and the things that we liked on Facebook and the things that we, um, the commercials that we were watching or whatever it might be, were they selling this to Cambridge Analytica? Because Cambridge Analytica was able to get 50 million Facebook users' profiles um, through those quiz apps that people sometimes take on Facebook. And with that information, they were able to give it to um, conservative billionaire Republican Party supporters who were able to use psychographic profiling to target specific voters during the campaign. Um, now, Facebook has no relationship with Cambridge Analytica at this point in time, but it's truly crazy when you think about how just what we do on Facebook or on Instagram or any of that, how that can actually impact an election, which is kind of super scary. Um, all the information that we put out there, it is pretty smart, actually 100%, it's totally smart that people are, do, that they did that. Um, 
don't want to discredit it there, but at the same time, a little scary um, as well. But yes, uh, there are some brains involved there. And finally, the third parties I kept saying we were coming to and then we never got to, well, they're here finally. Um, and so for third parties, um, why do they exist and why haven't they really done anything? Um, so third parties are there basically to kind of make the two parties start talking about an issue. So a lot of times when you see when third parties have developed and gained some popularity within our country, it's because the two parties weren't focusing on anything. So like a lot of times we heard about third parties during the early 1900s. Um, it was a response to the robber barons and we saw the progressive movement take place, right? Um, and so we saw third parties come up because of that. And we do have various types of third parties within our country. So we have ideological parties. Um, so like um, libertarians, um, socialists, they would be considered ideological parties where they basically have a specific ideal or a specific philosophy. Um, and that is what their party stands for. Um, you might see splinter parties. Um, this is another popular type of third party. Ooh, I'll have to watch that, Sandra. I didn't know there was a movie documentary out about that. Um, splinter parties are another type of third party. And splinter parties basically are offshoots of a major party. So, for instance, like a few years ago, not too long ago, there was a Tea Party that was a splinter party off of um, the Republican Party. Um, now we're starting to see with the Democratic Party, if you look at some of the more liberal pre people um, like Alexandria Cortez um, Ocasio and some of her supporters, um, a lot of people are saying they might split. Off. Um, but a lot of times with splinter parties, what ends up happening is they end up being adopted back into the main party anyway. Um, an economic protest party. These are parties um, that we saw really take place in the late 19th century. Um, they're people who are going to be opposed to monopolies. Um, that's when we tended to see them come about. Um, so the populist party um, would be a good example of an economic protest party. They're basically just annoyed with the economy of our country at the time, and they want to form a third party to protest that. And then single issue parties, um, those will be parties like the Free Soil Movement, which was a Free Soil Party, which was against slavery, the Prohibition Party that was against booze. Um, they have one issue, that's all they care about. And once their one issue is solved, they dissolve, they're no longer a political party. Um, Modern third parties, you know, it's important. We have a lot of modern third parties um, in our country today. They're not really making, um, a, you know, they're not getting votes in the sense that we haven't seen a modern third party win the presidency. But what's important to understand is we've had modern third parties. Um, so like Ross Perot, who ran for president in the 90s, um, he was part of the Reform Party. And he didn't win the president, right? Presidency, we don't have a president pro in our history. But what we see modern presidencies, modern uh, third parties do is they take votes away from one of our two major parties. So a lot of people say Ross Pro is why George H.W. Bush lost to Bill Clinton. Um, people will also say Ralph Nader, um, when he ran with the Green Party in the 2000 election, people will say, that it's Al Gore who lost that election to George W. Bush because of the third party. So third parties aren't winning elections. These modern third parties aren't winning elections, but they're wreaking havoc in the sense that one of our main political parties might not be, um, might, are losing votes to this third party. Um, we even saw this um, in the 2016 election where you know people didn't want to vote for Clinton or Trump, so they voted for a third party. There are lots of difficulties that are faced by third parties, um, which make it super hard for them to be elected. Our electoral college in general makes it super difficult for a third party candidate to win office. Um, money and financing, third parties don't have the money and the resources that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party have. Um, but definitely for sure, it's that the way we elect our president through the electoral college um, that changes everything. If we didn't have the Electoral College, there probably would be a better chance of a third party coming about. We also see that a lot of times throughout history, you'll see like the Progressive Party 
Um, there is no longer a progressive party because the Republicans and Democrats ended up picking up their issues. And so the progressive party went away. Um, so we see that happening as well, where major parties will start to incorporate third party issues. Are elected independents technically a third party? That's a really good question. So, and this is, and we were actually talking about this at this lunch meeting um, that we have with students at my school where we can get together to discuss politics. So there is an official, like, independent political party. But if you look at the people within Congress um, who have been elected and who call themselves or refer to themselves as independent, they actually don't belong to the elected, and they don't belong to the official independent party. Um, they are better off being called unaffiliated in the sense that they don't affiliate themselves with any political party. So yeah, right now our current elected independents, except for the former governor of Minnesota, um, Jesse Ventura, who is officially an independent from the independent political party, but the ones currently we have, um, they're more unaffiliated in the sense that they don't belong to a political party in our country. And a lot of times the ones that we have get elected as a Republican or a Democrat. And then once they're in the Senate or in their house, in the house, they're like, oh, by the way, we're no longer a Republican or a Democrat. We're actually independent. Um, so the impact of third parties is kind of what I just mentioned as far as they're not winning elections, um, but they are still making an impact on elections by taking away votes from other candidates. That, I believe, is it before we get into questions um, that I have for you. So if you have questions for me, feel free to ask them. Um, otherwise, read this passage because um, we're going to be jumping into this passage. So you'll see that there's going to be questions tied um, to this passage. So I'll give you a second to read it. So this is nice and fresh. This is from Hillary Clinton, um, the DNC in 2016. And here is your question. There's two questions for this passage. First one, why was this passage most likely included in the candidate's message? Um, to cast a positive light on her opponent, to gain voters outside the Democratic Party, to show how much effort it takes to win the White House, or to promise her voters that she would implement democratic policies. So we have, oh, we have a lot of Bs coming in and that is the correct answer, right? So she's talking about, I'm just gonna jump back for a second. She'll be a president for Democrats, Republicans and independents. So yeah, she's trying to gain voters, gain voters outside the democratic party. Next question tied to this passage. What guidelines of messaging best align with this passage? A, since the nominating process is over, she can start to be specific about which groups to mention. B, since a general election is months away, she needs to keep her message general. C, since the nominating process is over, she doesn't have to worry about trying to gain the support of fellow party members. Or D, since the general election is months away, she needs to start addressing specific solutions to specific problems. So Quinn, is that B, B, C? So we're going, it looks like we're all tossing and turning between B and C here. So the answer is B. Um, since the general election is months away, she needs to keep her message general, right? So she wants to focus on all the voters. Um, C, she still wants, she does, so C, she doesn't want to lose her Democratic uh, Party members. I mean, she doesn't have to worry about um, them voting for her to give her the nomination, but she still needs to gain their support, right? She's going to need Democratic support to win the election. So that's why the correct answer is uh, B for this one as well. All right, next question. Which of the following best illustrates a critical election? An intense election with many controversial issues? An election that is so close it requires a recount, an election that reveals a lasting shift in voting block loyalties, or an election in which a challenging party replaces the incumbent party. To give you a hint, this is dealing with realignment. So which of these, uh, so realignment, 
is caused by a critical election. Maybe C. 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 Yeah, so the answer is going to be C, an election that reveals a lasting shift in voting block loyalties, right? So think about like the Great Depression and the New Deal coalition that forms. Think about the election around the civil rights movement and how it changes the voting block loyalties, meaning, you know, if Southerners tended to vote one way, they were a voting block. Now they're going to be loyal to a different political party. And we see this happening during what's called critical elections. Um, and I think I have one more, maybe. Yes, this is the last question. Um, which of the following is an accurate comparison of Democrats and Republicans? Um, so you want to make sure that both columns are correct under Democrats and Republicans. I'll give you a second to read in that you can start putting your answers in there. So we have one for A. No, we got a couple more for A. So you all are correct. It's an awesome way to end our practice questions. So A is correct. Um, the reason D is not correct is because Democrats um, are tend to be more pro-choice. So and Republicans tend to be more pro-life. So you would want to switch and answer D. Yeah, you would want to switch those back and forth. Um, but with A, it's correct. The uh, Democrats lost the South South during the Civil Rights Movement, right? And then we have seen that the Republicans, which were considered liberal when they first started because they supported um, movements against slavery, they've now become more conservative over time. Um, so A would be the correct answer there. Are there any questions um, I can answer from any of you all? Um, I'm just going to show you. I think the last slide is, you know, always the what's coming up next. But I'm happy to answer any questions um, about anything about political parties. As is Frankie, who uh, couldn't stay away from the screen tonight. So again, coming up to uh, Thursday, there's two, um, one at seven o'clock on economics and Keynesian versus supply side, one at 9.15, which is so past my bedtime, on selection and nomination of federal judges. They give credit to who's ever doing that one. Uh, Monday, weekly current events, and then I'm back next Tuesday at seven o'clock, so an hour earlier. Um, with first and second amendments, why do some southern states still have statewide elected officials? Um, well, all states are going to have statewide elected officials. Can you explain your question a little bit more? So, like, all states have senators who I'm considering as a statewide elected official. So, Democrat, oh, okay, statewide Democrat elected officials. Okay, good question. So these are generalizations that we make, right? So when we say that the South um, votes Republican, it doesn't mean that there's not exceptions to that. Like, so even West Virginia is a great example of this. West Virginia tends to vote Republican, but their senator is a Democrat. So there are some times where like, now he's a Democrat, but he tends to be more of a conservative Democrat. So you'll see situations like in the South where you might have Democratic senators or Democratic uh, people serving the House of Representatives, they just might tend to be more of the conservative Democrat. And so therefore, people are going to vote for them. So when we make these, it's like California, right? Super liberal state, but there's actually Republicans who come elected from California. So it's like we make these generalizations saying that, yes, the South tends to vote uh, Republican, doesn't mean every single person in the South is going to vote Republican, right? There's still going to be outliers there, um, and that will lead to some Democrats getting elected. But great question. Any other questions? So join me next Tuesday night, First and Second Amendments. Uh, 
very timely, right? Second Amendment, gun rights, First Amendment, we're really going to focus on freedom of speech um, and freedom of religion. And then next Thursday night, uh, there'll be a stream on monetary policy and the Federal Reserve. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you for the awesome questions. Thank you for participating. Um, and I hope you all have a lovely rest of the week. And I hope to see you again next week. Thank you.